normally this would be moved up, but I have enough experience doing this that I can do it. <laughs> so that's not a problem. Well, I wanna say thank you to Ryan and thank you to John as well uh, for that wonderful time of worship. Genuinely, that first song, There's Joy in the House of the Lord, that spoke to me in a powerful way this morning because this morning as you know, we're gonna go into this message, as we're gonna talk a little bit about being in God's presence, it helps me realize that when we say there's joy in the house of the Lord, why are we saying that there's joy? Why are we happy? You know, why do we have this sense of fullness when we are in his house? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized the reason that we have this joy, we have this sense of completeness is because we are in God's presence and we are doing what we have been called to do, which is worshiping him, talking with him, communing with him. So. That song, I feel like, has perfectly set us up to go into, in today's message. And before I start, I also wanna say a huge thank you to Dr. Shaw, because without him, I wouldn't have the opportunity to be up here. And also, without him, I don't know that I would have anything ready to talk to y'all about, because he has really genuinely helped me a lot. He gave me access to all of his resources, his entire library, and he helped me you know, pick out the topic, so huge thank you. Six years ago, I remember I had just gotten my license. I was um, a young lad, I still am, but <laughs> I'd been working my first job at um, Chick-fil-A. I'd been working there for about two years and it was pretty fun. I was having a good time. For some reason, I don't know what happened in that you know, time between turning 15 to 16, but I had this passion and this drive to learn. I wanted to learn as much as I could about Christian theology, about you know, church history, about Christianity and all of those things in general. I wanted to really grow deeper in my faith. And in doing that, I did multiple you know, times where I would study and I would try to find you know, books or resources. And I had the world's you know, greatest libraries, Google and YouTube at my fingertips. And I would, I would just watch videos, I would read articles. And about six months into all of this research, when I was you know, gathering information, stuff that I didn't know, stuff that I might have known that I needed to relearn, and about six, month in, six months in, I had decided that I knew everything that there was to know about these subjects. <laughs> and I, I mean, I was, I was confident that I knew it all, and that's a trait that I get from my father, if anybody <laughs> knows him. But I knew that I knew it all. And I can tell you this, I was blown away when I came to Clearview for the first time. I came to Clearview, I sat down at the worship service and I still remember it like it was yesterday. The first song that they played was Mighty to Save and I'd never heard people perform worship and sing worship in a way that moved me so much. And then I also remember looking at the bulletin and seeing, okay, the message is Father's Wanted. Okay, so this is gonna be on fatherhood. At least I came for the worship because I don't really know what I'm gonna be able to glean from a message on fatherhood. I had no clue, like no clue at all that when I got, or not I, when he got up on stage, Dr. Shaw got up on stage to preach this message on fatherhood that I would learn so much, even about my Christian walk and my Christian life. I'd never met somebody or heard anybody who could teach in such a, powerful way that was simple, but also taught you the deep things of God. And I knew from that moment, when I heard that message, when I was involved in that worship, that this is the church that I needed to get involved in. So I started trying to find ways to help out, you know, do stuff with technology. I would run like ProPresenter in the back and small things here and there, all stuff that needed to be done. And, you know, I was enjoying myself. Well, the person who invited me to come to this church, I won't, I won't name who they are, but they've been a huge help in showing me this place and you know, getting me involved. They told John that I could sing and that I you know, did stuff with music. And without consulting me, they put me on the praise team. <laughs> and I remember like, being asked to come up one Sunday to sing on the praise team and I had no clue like, what I was doing. I had no clue that I was even supposed to be there. And that started this long, but very, very beneficial and joyful journey of growing and learning you know, here at Clearview. So I got more involved with the staff, um, started doing stuff like internship and trying to 
make friends with the staff, but also learn more about what they believe. And I remember that Dr. Shaw, I started trying to be friends with him, but that friendship turned very quickly into a mentorship where I would go and I would ask him, I would say, hey, I'm trying to study or I'm trying to learn about this subject. I wanna know more about theology or I wanna know more about salvation and like all of these deep things about it. Do you have any resources or any books or any articles? And every, off, like every so often when I would ask him, he would give me a book and he would say, here, read this, come back, tell me what you think. And it started with a book on apologetics and that really changed my course there. But the one that I remember most and the one that still sticks with me even to today is I asked him for resources on prayer. I wanted to learn how to be a man of prayer, someone who prays effectively, someone who prays honestly, and someone who isn't, you know, afraid to pray for big things, but also is humble and knows that God is in control. And I didn't know where to start. I didn't know anything about it. So he recommended this small book right here. It's called Power Through Prayer by E. M. Bounds. And this book lit a fire in me for the subject of prayer. I have used it so much. It's a short book, so you can read it probably in maybe one or two sittings. And I've, I've gone through it so much that I've like broken the book. Um, but it has really, really genuinely affected me and impacted me in such a deep way. And this morning, all I wanna do is I wanna share over the past you know, six years that I've been learning, ever since I got this book, and how I've been growing in prayer. And I wanna share with you, you know, kind of what prayer is. I wanna share with you some mistakes that I've made in prayer and how you know, I thought I was doing the right thing, but really I wasn't doing the right thing. And hopefully you can glean and you can learn from these mistakes. And then I wanna also share what I've been doing here recently in my prayer life, something that's a new development that has been, that's been pretty helpful. So that brings us here to our verse for today. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter five. It starts in verse 16 and it goes all the way down to verse 18. It says, uh, rejoice always and pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, these verses are pretty short, so I'm gonna read it one more time just so that we can make sure it soaks in and so I can give you guys some time to look in and if you wanna see it as well. But it starts in verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So like I said, one of my favorite things to study, prayer. Always, you know, since I got this book and since I've started, always has been. If any of you know me well, you know that when I wanna learn about something or when I, you know, try to study something, I become obsessive over it. I start, you know, looking at everything that I look at, everything that I read, everything that I listen to, no matter what it is, I dive into that subject. When I was trying to learn about things like health and fitness, everything that I watched, everything that I read, everything completely was about this subject. When I wanted to learn about theology or Christian literature, everything that I would consume was based around this subject. And one thing that always came back to me, even though I would hop and I would obsess over different things, which I will say, obsessing over different things isn't always a great thing because then you forget certain aspects of other things. But anyways, when I would hop from different thing, one thing to another thing, I would always come back somehow to prayer. And I got to thinking to myself, what's the reason behind prayer? Like, why is that important to me? And as I studied and I began to really ask myself, I realized that prayer is important to me and it should be to all of us because all of the great men and women who have done something of value for the kingdom of God, who have made an impact for the gospel, they have been men and women who have devoted their lives to prayer. And that is, hopefully, I want that to be true of me by the time, you know, I'm gone. By the time I leave this world, I want people to look back and to be able to say that I was a man, that my team, the men and women on my team, that Dr. Shaw, we were people of prayer and that we made an impact. And that's what I want for this church, for all of you. I want us to be a church who values prayer. And through our prayers, through our closeness to God, we can say that this church made an impact. This church shared the gospel with people who needed it most. And that's why I think prayer has always been one of the main subjects, one of the things that I always come back to. It's because it's so important. It's so vital to have that fellowship and that closeness with God. So what is prayer? 
that was the number one question that, you know, I feel like everybody has an answer. Everybody knows what prayer is. But I wanted to lay that foundation because if I didn't know what prayer was biblically, then I'm getting off on the wrong foot and I'm gonna not end up in the right place. So I looked through the scripture and there are many examples of biblical men and women who have prayed and who had these great prayer lives. When I first thought about it, I thought Adam and Eve. Of course, they had the fall, but before the fall, their walk with God was the most real and the most literal walk with God that we can see in the Bible. They really walked with God. And then I see people like Joseph who through all the ups and downs, he considered God, he had prayer in his heart. And then I think of Moses. Moses is one of like my aspirations. I wanna be like Moses and have that kind of prayer life because whenever the nation of Israel messed up and did something to anger God, it was because of Moses praying. It was because of him asking God, please remember your covenant and don't do this to your people. He changed the fate of that nation. If it wasn't for him and his prayer life, I don't know that we could say they would be where they are right now. And then also, when you look in the Old Testament, you have David. We talked about the Psalms last week. Uh, the Psalms, they're such you know, great writing, such a great collection. That's a great book. Because everything in the Psalms, from the beginning to the end, is either a prayer of praise or a prayer of supplication, asking God to be our fortress, to be our mighty one. Or it's praising God, saying thank you for who you are, for what you've done, and for everything that you've given us. So I was looking through the Old Testament and I was trying to find you know, a good example from the Old Testament of what a prayer is, like an Old Testament prayer. And it always went back to the um, prayer of Solomon for wisdom. That comes in 1 Kings 3, seven through nine. And it says, now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David, but I'm a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And then if we go into the New Testament, we can see plenty of other examples of prayer. There is people like Paul. When you look in his life, his entire life, you see prayer for his churches, for the gospel to be furthered. You know, everything that he did was bathed in prayer. And then we also look and we can see people like James. If you read his book, you know, at the end, he talks about, you know, the prayer and effective prayer. And then you can see people like John, who I would say the whole first John, the whole book of first John has prayer just inter interweaved throughout the entire book. And then obviously, I don't have to say this, but the most obvious example of prayer in the New Testament is Jesus. When we look at Christ and we look at his life, we see that everything that he did and everything that he said had prayer that preceded it. We see that, you know, throughout his entire ministry, he had this connection and this oneness with the Father. But we also see that he had these long times spent in prayer in the garden, or he had this cave where he would withdraw and he would just pray for hours on end. So we can see that prayer is important. And we can see that these men and these women in the Bible have their lives filled with prayer. But what does prayer actually entail? Like, what is prayer? I wanna go back to the first Kings verse. Um, if we look, we see in first Kings where it says, now, O Lord, my God. See, it starts off by addressing God. It starts off by talking to God. And then even in the New Testament, like I said, um, we have Jesus's prayers and we have the um, the Lord's Prayer here, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven. And it may seem obvious, it may seem very simple, but to be able to have a correct foundation, we have to know that prayer is just a conversation with God, it's fellowship with God. There's nothing you know, too convoluted, there's nothing overly, overly complicated about what prayer is. It's just us talking to God. And as simple as it may be, it's still easy to make mistakes while praying. And I've made my fair share of mistakes in prayer. And I wanna share just a few because although I have this foundation of what prayer is, it's this conversation with God, I hope that through me sharing some of these, you can see in your life maybe some places where you're making mistakes or some places where you can just improve your prayer life. So first, and one of the bigger mistakes that I made in prayer was I would use prayer to feel more spiritual. And in doing so, 
I would make my prayers more spiritual than you know they actually needed to be. I would try to make the prayer so lofty. I would use these big words and I would use these big ideas and I would always, not that it's wrong to pray scripture, but I was always, always try to include a scripture so that I felt like there was the spiritual nature of the prayer. And in doing that, I was pretty much just trying to throw my prayer up to God, hoping that he could catch it. But we all know that every single one of us, especially myself, when we pray, we're not throwing anything up. If anything, it's going down and God has to go and he has to get it. He has to retrieve this prayer. And another problem with thinking this way of trying to have these spiritual prayers is in using this big spiritual and lofty language, I made a distinction. I made two different categories of the things that I prayed for and then the real world. If I were praying for the lost in the dying world, instead of praying for people in this community who need prayer, instead of praying for people who I know who are lost, I was praying for this category, uh, this just general idea of people. And in doing so, when I left my prayer closet, when I actually you know, was done praying, any emotion or any love or any you know, goodwill that I had towards these people was completely non-existent because I was praying to this, you know, this fake theoretical group of people. Instead of praying specifically for people that I knew needed prayer, if I knew somebody in my family needed prayer because maybe they're not saved, maybe they're lost, instead of praying God save them and then work through circumstances that they have, I would pray for their soul, for spiritual blessings, and these big things that in essence seemed to be the right things to pray. But in all reality, in praying for, the, for them this way, I would make that distinction. So then when I saw them in real life, if they did something to upset me, I would hold it against them because there wasn't any love or any real you know, goodwill towards them because I was praying for a fake person. And the biggest thing that I've done to combat this and it's helped me a lot is I pray now specifically. I am honest and I'm open in my prayers. I don't feel like I have to try to throw up any kind of you know, lofty words. I just pray with the same way that I would talk to you guys. And then in praying, if I know who I'm praying for, I'll ask, you know, is there anything I can pray for you for specifically? Is there anything that I can give you or I can you know, pray for you? And some people are happy to share that information. Some people are more private and that's completely fine. That's completely not a problem at all. But I still try to be more specific in my prayers for their family, for their life, and just for their job, anything that they're going through. The second biggest mistake that I made was I would try to use prayer as a test of whether I was a good Christian or a bad Christian. And this seems wrong for obvious reasons because prayer and the time that I spend in prayer, one, if I spent 30 minutes for seven days a week, I would say, okay, nice. I'm a good Christian. I can check that off my list. I prayed. When all, in all reality, that's not at all how it is working. See, and the biggest problem with this is on the days where life got hectic, where life kind of got everywhere and I didn't feel like I could maintain this, when I missed that time of prayer, instead of going back to the Father, knowing that without Him I couldn't pray and I need His grace, I would feel this sense of guilt and this sense of shame, thinking, okay, now I have a backlog of prayer. Now I need to work through all of this that I missed and I need to get to this place, you know, to where I'm now right with God. And it put this sense of shame and this sense of guilt around prayer so that I never wanted to pray. It was very easy to distract me from praying. Because if I get up in the morning and it's five o'clock, okay, I gotta be at the gym in 20 minutes or else you know, I'm gonna be late, so prayer can wait until tonight. And then I get home that night and say it's 9.30 and God closes up shop at 9.20, so I can't pray now. <laughs> so you know, there was this sense of always putting it off because there was this guilt and this shame around prayer. So I didn't wanna do it. And the biggest thing that's helped me with this is realizing that God doesn't need me to pray to him. Of course he wants it, of course he loves it, he loves that fellowship, but in not praying to him, I'm not hurting him or I'm not you know, depriving him of anything he needs. What I'm doing is I'm hurting myself. I'm you know, detuning my heart so that now I'm not in line with God. My mind in the things that I say and the things that I do don't line up with the way that God wants me to be. One thing that helped me is I started to think Almost like, like I said, I get up and go to the gym in the mornings. So if I miss a day at the gym and I don't lift weights, the weights aren't gonna be mad at me that I didn't go and lift them. 
and then they're not gonna then hold a grudge the next time I go because they don't need me to come in there and lift them. They don't care about that. Well, that breaks down in a good way because now not only does he not need me to do it, but he loves it when I do it. So there's not this sense of, okay, now I have to work through this backlog and he is gonna be mad. Now it's this sense of joy knowing that, okay, I missed a day, but God's grace is gonna cover me and I can go to him knowing that his love is still sufficient, his love is still there and nothing can separate me from that. So now my prayer life has been enhanced because when I miss a day, it's only just a driver to get back in there praying because I know that I'm missing out on God's love and God's grace. And then lastly, one of the bigger issues that I've had with prayer, one of the bigger mistakes that I've made um, that hindered my prayer life a lot was I would use unanswered prayers as a test of God's love. And I know this sounds kind of funny, but mentally I knew in my mind that God loves me, God is love. He's gonna work all things together for my good. You know, I knew all of the scriptures, I knew all of that. But emotionally, within myself, when a prayer went unanswered and I thought that I was slighted or wronged in any way, it was not as easy to overcome that as I thought it would be. And what this did is using this as like a test for God's love really put me at a place where my faith was hurt because I didn't trust God the way that I should. I didn't trust him to know what was best. And I thought these unanswered prayers just went unanswered because he didn't listen or he didn't care as much as I thought he should. And then it made even things like working, it made things like coming and worshiping, it made it hard because when I think that I've been slighted by God for something that I think I should have, why would I get up here and why would I worship? Like, what's the purpose behind that? You're not gonna give it to me anyways. And the biggest thing that helped me was realizing and knowing that I have to trust God because I am bound by time. Y'all are all bound by time. Every single one of us, we're bound in this thing called time. We have a beginning and we have an end. But God is above that. God is beyond that. Therefore, when I see something that I need, if I think I need it now or I think I need it at this specific time, I have to realize that God seeing past all of that realizes that if I have this, when I think I need it, I'm gonna mess everything up. Or if I have it later and I thought I needed it now, I'm gonna either appreciate it more or at that time when he gives it to me, it's gonna be much more useful, much more necessary. And not only that, but it's gonna impact the people's lives around me more than it would have if I had it when I thought I needed it. And just kind of seeing God as outside of time, realizing that he is far above me. He knows way more than I could ever hope to know. That has helped me in that aspect of my prayer life as well. So knowing all of that, building that foundation and overcoming those mistakes, and I'm sure that there are many other mistakes that I make, things that I have to overcome, but having that foundation, this entire week, I've been trying something. Um, in preparation for getting up here and talking to you guys, I wanted to try this out. I wanted to challenge myself to do this praying without ceasing. You know, verse 17, pray without ceasing. It's very simple. And what I didn't understand is how do I do that? Is that 24 seven, I'm praying to God. I am, you know, uttering words 24 seven somehow with the exception of sleep or is that every five minutes throughout the day, I'll stop. And then five minutes later, I'll stop. And then five, I didn't understand what that meant. So Pastor Shaw recommended this book here. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. And I read through this. This is again, a short book. You could probably read it in one sitting. Um, I read through it and I told myself, I'm gonna challenge myself. Everything this book says about prayer, I'm going to implement it. I'm gonna try it. And if it works, if it benefits me, then I'll keep it. But if it doesn't work, then I'll throw it out. And then lastly, if there are things that work, I'll keep those. And if there are things that don't, then I don't need to keep those. This has not been an easy week because practicing that is not, it's not an easy thing. It's a habit that has to be formed. And before I go any further, I wanna challenge all of you guys. What I'm, what I'm about to tell you guys about this book, I, I challenge you guys to practice that just this week from Sunday, today until Sunday next week, just try to implement this in your life as best as you can. To sum up the book, it says pretty much that God's presence 
is always around us. If we're saved, if we're in Christ, then God's presence is in us. So what it's challenging us to do is to tune our hearts and to just remember that no matter what, we are in God's presence. That no matter what's happening, we have that full access to Him completely. And then when you remind yourself that you're in God's presence, use that time to either praise Him, to ask Him for strength or for help in things that you might be doing. And like I said, it hasn't been easy because the first day that I had determined I was gonna do this challenge, which was Monday, I didn't do it at all because I completely forgot about it. Like I, I woke up and I was like, okay, I can do this. And then instantly went about doing everything else I was supposed to be doing and forgot. Tuesday I got up and I remembered and I was like, okay, I told myself I was gonna try this challenge. I've got to do it this time. So I got up, came here, got to work. And first thing I normally do is I make a pot of coffee for the office. I was scooping the coffee in and about two scoops in, I forgot completely that I was supposed to be doing this. And that happened throughout the day where I would forget and I would remember and I would forget and I would remember. And I'm gonna tell you guys that if you're gonna accept this challenge and try it, it's not gonna be an easy task. There are gonna be days where you forget completely. There are gonna be times where you forget and you have to just remind yourself. But don't let the distractions, don't let the times you forget be fuel to beat yourself up or to think how bad of a Christian or whatever it is that I am. Because when you do that, that only further serves as a distraction, as just another distraction. So what I did is anytime I realized I was distracted, instead of dwelling on it, I would bring it before God and say, God, I'm trying to do this. I forgot. I got distracted. Here's what distracted me. It might not even be a bad thing. It might not even be sin. It might just be having a conversation with a friend. But this distracted me from doing this. So I'm giving this to you and I'm asking that you would give me your grace. Because first of all, apart from his grace, trying to do this at all would not be possible. Like we couldn't, we wouldn't even have the motivation or the drive to pray if it wasn't for his grace. And we wouldn't have the ability to pray if it wasn't for Christ, his sacrifice, what he did. So again, you have to remind yourself the importance and you have to remind yourself not to you know, beat yourself up over distractions. But another thing that really helped me, and it says it in this book, is whenever I felt temptation, whether that was to have some kind of worry or anxiety or to be angry at somebody who said something to me that kind of you know, set me off a little bit, instead of letting that pull my heart away from God, what I would do is I would lay that temptation. As soon as I realized I was feeling that temptation, I would lay that before God. So instead of trying to fight it on my own and then bring God my victory, I would say, Lord, I need you right now because I'm feeling this drawing me away from you. You bring me the victory. And I noticed throughout this entire week that whenever I felt distracted from prayer, whenever I felt tempted, it was only a driver and it was only motivation to pray, to bring these distractions and these you know, temptations and these sins to God. So instead of doing what they were supposed to do, which is pull me away from God, all they did was push me closer to God. And that's helped me a lot this week because like I said, I've been distracted a lot. And the, only, the other thing that this did is throughout the week, I have been extremely nervous about getting up here and talking. This is you know, not my strong suit. This is not what I feel that I'm called to do. But I wanted to share something of value. I wanted to be able to have something to say that you guys could take away and maybe implement in some way. And thinking about that really put my stomach in knots because I can get up here and I could try to fill 30 minutes and then hopefully we can all go home and be happy. But I wanted to say something of value. And there was one night this week, I think it was Monday night, where I was so nervous about this, I didn't really even sleep much. So I was thinking, and I was trying to recall the presence of God and it wasn't until Wednesday when I remembered. Okay, I was like, okay, it's Wednesday. I need to try to practice this thing. You know, practice what I'm fixing to go up here and tell, these, and tell everybody. And as I practiced it, as I reminded myself that God's presence was with me, it was like all the anxiety and all the worry that I felt over getting up here and speaking, it just dropped away. It left and the peace of God which completely surpassed my understanding, surrounded me. And I wanna tell you guys that through this week, even if you struggle with remembering God's presence, even if you struggle with reminding yourself that God is with you and praying and asking him you know, for his grace and his strength, there will come a point 
where God will just surround you with peace and everything that you might be worried about, anything that might be going on in your life that's hard to deal with, I don't know what it is. God will give you that peace because you realize that if God's with me, all these other things that I'm worried about, they're so small in comparison to God. His presence being with me, his strength being with me, shows me that all these things that I'm worried about are really nothing to worry about at all. And that's my biggest challenge, is I hope that you guys can try that and that you guys can experience that peace in the same way that I did. But as you guys try that, as you guys do that throughout this week, I do want to remind you that praying constantly throughout the day, reminding yourself of God's presence, cannot be replacing, this can't be a replacement for private prayer, for spending that time where you schedule out time with the Lord. That has to come first, because if you try to have short and effective prayers where you can say two or three words, that's not gonna happen unless you have first spent a long time with God in prayer, alone with God, focused, asking Him to work in your life, to show you His will. And I looked through scriptures just to make sure that everything that I'm saying you know, has some kind of biblical background because I didn't wanna say anything unbiblical. And every person that I looked at like I told you in the beginning, I said, I said, Paul, he obviously throughout his day, throughout whatever he was doing, he was praying and praising God. But there was also days and nights where he spent all day and night praying. There was people like Daniel, who I don't think we can argue that throughout his day, he remembered God. He relied on God's spirit to give him strength. But he withdrew three times a day just to have focused alone time, alone time prayer with God. And then we have David who said that he meditated day and night. I'm sure that throughout his day, he remembered God. I'm sure that there were times where he was writing throughout the day, but he took that specific time in the morning and at night to meditate on God and on his word. And then lastly, we see Jesus, who I think we could argue, I don't even have to argue, you guys would agree with me. He has the example, the best prayer life that we could hope to have. When we think about his prayer life, of course, throughout his entire day, he would be communing and talking with God and doing God's will. But when you look through the scriptures, you see that there were nights where he spent hours in prayer. There were nights and there were mornings where he spent all day until the sun rose in prayer. So I just want us to remember that we can't replace these short and sporadic prayers, which are good, which are, it's good to remind yourself of God's presence, but we can't have that be a replacement for spending that focused time with the Lord. And I do wanna say, I don't want you guys to think that I'm saying that the effectiveness of our prayer is measured by the time we spend in prayer. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's not that we're spending a long time and if we reach the four hour mark, now our prayers are effective. No, the reason it's effective to spend a long time in prayer is because we are impressing on our hearts the importance of being alone with God. And we're giving God the time to work in our hearts and in our lives. One of the biggest examples that I can think of when I think of that is Jacob. He has one of the greatest victories of faith. He prevailed you know, against the Lord, but he wouldn't have had that victory of faith and he wouldn't be who he was had he not wrestled all night with God. So, you know, as I'm closing, I wanna ask you guys, how is your prayer life? You don't have to answer me. I just want you to think about it in your heart. Have, has your prayer life been good? Has it been on fire? Because if it has, then praise God. But if you're here this morning and you're not saved, I want to tell you first and foremost, that has to be the priority because you can't have a prayer life unless you have Christ in your life. If you don't have Jesus Christ covering your sin, taking your penalty, then you're still at enmity with God. This morning, as we're getting ready to have this altar call, I wanna invite you, if you're not saved, to come down, to get things right with God, to pray and ask Him, Lord Jesus, please take my sin away. Lord, come into my heart and be my King. Let that be the first prayer that you pray in this new life of yours. 
And then if you're here this morning and you have a good prayer life, then praise God. I ask you to come down and to pray for the people who might not have that, to pray for the people who need Christ. Or maybe lastly, you're here this morning and you had a good prayer life, but things have gotten in the way. You haven't spent the time that you need to be in the word, to be on your knees in prayer. I invite you to come and to ask Christ to reignite that fire, that passion in your heart for prayer, so that you can experience that closeness and that fellowship and that peace.